Hello everyone, yes, my name is Helen Weisinger and I am the Chief Client Officer for Outdoor Plus. And as the new girl to the medium, I feel really uh, privileged to be able to stand up here in front of you today to be able to give you my thoughts on digital out of home uh, into a room that is probably full of seasoned out of home experts. Um, just out of interest, who in this room has worked in out of home for less than a year? Stick your hands up if you have. Okay. Who is less than five years? Okay. More than 10? Wow. Okay. There's a lot of knowledge in the room. Okay. Brilliant. Um, well, prior to joining uh, Outdoor Plus, um, I actually spent 20 plus years uh, working at creative agencies. And eight months in, I hope to cover in the next uh, 30 minutes what I see as a sort of potted history of outdoor, followed by a brief glimpse at what I think the future uh, of our industry could look like from my perspective as the new kid on the block. Now then, first question, as I'm in questioning mode, um, how many people here know what the oldest profession in the world is? <laughs> Quite a few by the sounds of things, fantastic. Well, it is prostitution. Now, what is actually less well known is what the second oldest prostitute, uh, second, <laughs> forgive me, not that. The second, not the second oldest prostitute, but the second oldest profession in the uh, world is. And it is in fact advertising, but to be more specific, it's out of home advertising. Now, the reason that is the case is, is simple. It's because the earliest roots of what we today know as out of home date back to at least 4,000 BC at a time when cavemen used to scratch communication uh, onto walls of caves to convey messages to others. And ultimately, that was the start and the birth of the creative and advertising industry. The reason that they chose to communicate through outdoor and advertising isn't exactly rocket scientists. Rocket science. Not too many people at that time were watching television, not too many people were reading newspapers, and not too many people were listening to radio. And some might say, not a lot has changed. Um, so while discussing the fact that not a lot, uh, uh, that, while discussing the fact that not much has changed, it's also probably worth exploring the reason why people from those days to now have always wanted to communicate a message with others. Um, and the psychology, uh, I think it's summed up really by this quote from Walter Scott, which says, a man has been called the reasoning animal, but he could with greater truthfulness be called the creature of suggestion. He is reasonable, but is to a greater extent suggestible. And I think the psychology behind this is, is clear. In simple terms, what he is saying is that as a suggestible animal, a human being's behavior can be changed and influenced through the power of amplifying thoughts. Now, on the subject of change, the speed of change that the digital revolution has brought has been utterly incredible. But while we've seen such a huge change in terms of digital ev evolution, the size of our brains across that same period, 20, well, in fact, long going back to caveman days, 20,000 years ago, it hasn't changed across the same period. Our brains have stayed pretty much the same for 20,000 years, sort of flatlining flat there across the bottom. I mean, the truth of the matter is that actually in real terms, uh, we've seen a 10% reduction in our brain size, a kind of tennis ball size of gray matter as our kind of noggins here have had to kind of optimize to, uh, to deal with a kind of more mental versus kind of physical exertion. I mean, personally, I blame Jeremy Kyle for the kind of reduction in my, my brain size, but there you go. Um, and as our kind of brains have become smaller over the years, uh, what's also happened is our attention and our recall uh, has become challenged as we've now got so much more information flying in and out. And I think, you know, what's interesting is far more recently as the modern media world as we now know it and as it's developed, the king of Madison, Madison Avenue himself latched onto this theme when he said, it took millions of years for man's instincts to develop. 
It will take millions more for them to even vary. It is fashionable to talk about changing man. A communicator must be concerned with unchanging man. Now, obviously, back in the 50s, not even Bill Birnbach could have anticipated the sort of seismic change or the shift or the, the rate of change and pace that, would, that the digital age of information would bring. However, what he did understand this was that whatever technology could enable in the future, the fundamentals of advertising will always remain. Now, going back to our kind of plotted history, really, and returning to kind of our evolutionary timeline, very little change for, from the kind of caveman era to, you know, for the next sort of 6,000 years. Out of home was always seen as a great communication channel. And, you know, whether that was for the kind of wanted posters back in the late 1800s, to the beautiful Parisian uh, French uh, poster art, or indeed to kind of the mass political propaganda advertising that we've, that we've seen. But I think the biggest advance in the out-of-home industry during that period was to actually replace long-term painted, fixed painted signs for this ability to be able to change posters on a monthly basis. <gasps> it must be the first of the month, new billboard day! <laughs> <laughs> Find his keepers. This year, give her English muffins. Whatever you say, Mr. Billboard. So, while it is true, not a lot changed for uh, 6,000 years, the last 35 years in the, in the world of outdoor has seen quite significant changes. You know, let's uh, sort of cast your mind back to the 19 eras. Um, you know, the era of big shoulder pads, big hair, kajagoogoo. But it also was the start of a whole new world for out of home. We saw the introduction of the two-week posting cycle as well as the introduction of the earliest trivisions. And then as we moved into kind of the 90s Brit pop era, we saw the first large format backlights, then the scrolling backlights. Before digital, as we, as we now know it, kicked off at the start of the 21st century, originally with transvisions in some of the main termini. But the other thing that I think is, is interesting is that uh, what has also changed, while outdoor has changed over that same period beyond recognition, is uh, set the audiences that, have been, that are being delivered by some of the other more traditional media. So... Again, looking back to 1986, um, I think what was interesting back then was that the most watched TV event of the year uh, back in 96 was that moment, I'm sure most of you can remember it if you were alive then, uh, was the, the moment that Den announces he's going to divorce Angie. And, and ITV, enjoy, ITV didn't, the BBC enjoyed uh, viewing figures of sort of 30.1 uh, million viewers at that time. Compare that with last year in 2016, and the largest TV audience achieved was 13.1 million viewers, which was for the Great British Bake Off. Now, it's not just television that has seen a significant dive. It's also newspapers. And, you know, whilst, you know, the, the reach here, I'm picking on the sun specifically, but the sun in 1986 was enjoying a readership of 11.6 million uh, readers per day versus as of 2016, it's dropped to 3.9 million. So whilst the kind of reach of traditional media over that kind of 30-year 30, 30 period has shrunk to about a third, during the same period, the good news for us people in the out-of-home industry is that actually out-of-home's reach has continued to grow, with much more people spending much more time out-of-home uh, out a day. I mean, we're looking you know, now at a kind of 6.97 hours per day out-of-home, which is sort of an increase of about 35% over the same period. And I think it's against this background and this backdrop that I... Uh, will humiliate him for a moment uh, and read this, uh, I beg your pardon, go back to it, this quote from Jonathan Lewis that appeared in the uh, Evening Standard a few years ago, where he said, 20 years ago, if Martians had landed on Earth, the first thing they would do would be to take over the TV channels. In five years from now, I believe they would take over digital outdoor first. There will be no better way to reach the highest number of people in the quickest time. 
Now, he's obviously taken much mockery over the years for that quote, uh, but it does become achingly relevant because what hasn't changed from a comms perspective is the fact that we are, need to get messaging to the biggest number of people in the shortest time, and that's not just if you're a Martian. Right, back in the room, 2017, we are back today. History lesson is over. And uh, a time that we are bombarded with channels, many more channels than ever before, and a time where consumers are just hit day, minute by minute with messaging. And I think this, what I find, found interesting, this is a really interesting uh, fact that I found out. A professor at Harvard Business School put a dollar value on the price of attention. And the notional price for people's attention since 2010 has increased by 20%. Now, with the ever-growing number of ch new channels available, it's having an effect on people's attention because, you know, attention is so much more difficult to grab, you know, because we're all busy texting, we're tweeting, we're Snapchatting, we're, you know, looking about how a cat, you know, gets frightened by a, cu by a cucumber on YouTube, whatever it might be. But as part of this growth of, of channels and through this kind of perceived panacea of online, what I think has happened as a result is that marketeers now believe that one-to-one -one personalized communication is the answer. And I think it's probably been driven by films like this. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, no is the one less traveled. Good evening, John. You can move the old fashioned John Anderson. Every 20 miles, Charles provides gourmet cuisine. John Anderson, you can use a Guinness right about now. Stressed out, John Anderson. Get away, John Anderson. Forget your troubles. What's still, John Anderson? Now, it's my view that back in 2002, sci-fi writers got it wrong. They got it badly wrong because they thought the magic of science was this ability for us to be able to target one-on-one. -on -one. And it's not. It is, in fact, the ability to target mass audiences with the right message in the right place at the right time. And I think that the mistake that too many brands um, make today is focusing too much of their advertising by talking to those consumers that are already advocates. And they need to be talking to those consumers that aren't. And uh, I joined a Posterscope breakfast uh, recently, uh, and Sir John Hegarty, the very eloquent Sir John Hegarty, summed it up best when he said this, a generation of marketing directors are failing to understand how to build powerful brands they confuse persuasion with promotion. And I think he's absolutely right. I think as an industry, we are in danger of talking to three people and a dog. I mean, after all, nobody kind of woke up and said, did you see that great paid search ad last night? Now, while he is absolutely categorically right, I also think there is a big issue facing our industry when it comes to out of home. And I think that too many of the great ideas that we, or the perceived great ideas, are stunt-led and for award's sake only. Forgive me for a minute, I'm going to pick on British Airways uh, as an example of this. This was a hugely award-winning idea that ran on two sites in London, and it was hardly seen by any of its target audience. Now, it won awards because the idea was strong. It is a fantastic, brilliant idea, and the tech behind it was incredibly simple. It was just a case of using a digital platform with an app. But I honestly believe that the motivation of this campaign was to win an award, and it was a campaign developed for creative ego rather than commercial success. And let's face it, how many people that don't work in advertising have ever kind of talked about this campaign? How many people booked a flight as a result? Tech should not be about what can bring a bit. Tech should be about what can bring a better result, not about what can bring an award, or at the very least, it should be doing both. I think, as an industry, what we need to be reflecting on instead is kind of the words of Byron Sharp when he talks about winning companies broadcast a brand's message widely enough to be heard by the largest possible swathe of consumers. 
And, and I think that is ever true. And let's, let's remind ourselves, I mean, I'm, I'm in a room full of people who love outdoors, so I'm sure I don't need to remind you that the beauty of Out of Home is the fact that it's not just a, cha a fantastic channel to deliver mass audiences at a time when people are most receptive to messaging. But of course, its core virtues remain the fact that it's a public voice and you can't skip it, you can't avoid it, and you can't block it. And the other thing, unlike traditional media, technology, far from being the enemy of, out of, of outdoor, it's been our friend. You know, it hasn't, it, it hasn't eroded our great offering, it has enhanced it. And I think the key for the issue is really, the industry is really, how do we make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater? Of course, let's embrace new tech and innovation, but at the same time, let's make sure we think about how we use it to bring mass uh, audiences, to bring relevance and to bring fame for brands. This is, after all, what TV, what outdoor does best, and it shouldn't just be left to the TV, uh, to TV to do this. And of course, although the world might change, the core values of what makes comms work hasn't. It's very much about the how we do, not the what we do. Now, what I thought I'd do is share a few examples of what that means and kind of give you some, uh, show you a few comp com concepts where technology has, or at least could, enable it uh, to become a reality. Now, first up, uh, I'm going to show, it's a well-known campaign for Apple. It's a brilliant example of a purposeful campaign and a brand that clearly loves outdoor. What I like about that campaign is the fact that they're showing off the technology of the phone and the capabilities of the phone. But God, I so wish they'd enhance this campaign even further by kind of using digital, iconic, large format screens to upload people's photos in real time and using real images. Because then I think it would have enabled them to change the photos as often as they chose and to be relevant to the time and place and they could have saved them some uh, slow and costly production costs at the same time. Next up is an example for Samsung, and this is not only Apple's uh, biggest global competitor, but take a look at this uh, smart idea that was done in Argentina.
brilliant and simple, and tech obviously being the uh, uh, enabler as, as that. One a little close to home now, uh, from Battersea uh, Dogs Home, and some of you may have seen this already. We started with a simple leafleting campaign, so we could identify the people who love dogs. And with paper-thin RFID chips embedded in the leaflets, we made them discoverable. Hidden sensors alerted the digital screens when someone with a leaflet approached, triggering our dog to appear. Whichever direction they approached, a different video was triggered. Just like a real stray, our dog appeared wherever they went. trying to attract their attention. <laughs> then he followed them from one poster to another, all around the area. Once he'd made his presence felt, he told people what he wanted them to do. With multiple screens all over the area, our dog followed people no matter which route they took. I think that's a really lovely campaign. Uh, it's an experiential campaign that demonstrates a, a number of things. Um, firstly, the value of networking a great idea across multiple sites. <clears throat> Secondly, the powerful connection that clearly exists between digital at home and our handheld devices. And finally, a reminder that the long held view that out of home cannot be used as a call to action just simply is no longer true. Next up is a campaign uh, we ran at Outdoor Plus for Universal Music. What do you mean? In April 2016, Justin Bieber had three singles from his album Purpose in the UK singles chart. That meant three singles on heavy rotation on the playlist of Capital FM, London's number one pop radio station. We wanted to convert this Bieber buzz into sales of the album. We created an audio feed to sync Capital FM's broadcast to media owner Outdoor Plus's digital poster sites. Whenever a DJ played a track from the album on Capital, our digital outdoor campaign was automatically triggered. Hits music. All the hits. Capital. While the song was on air, screens across London showed an ad for Beaver's album, with the message, playing right now on Capital FM, along with the name of the song currently being played. We then used geo-targeting to send messages to people who were walking or driving past the posters, giving them a link to stream the album on Spotify. Over the 11-day campaign, we delivered 1.6 million impacts. The activation contributed to a 31% sales uplift during the period the screens were live. Our campaign even caught the eye of Justin himself, who was drinking in a London pub around the corner from one of our outdoor sites. A man who clearly appreciates a joined-up music marketing campaign. Broadcast to outdoor screen, to mobile, to sale. So for me, that's a clear example of where technology and media partnerships work really well together to actually shift product. But I do have to ask myself the question, which was, you know, despite winning awards as well, why, you know, this campaign hasn't driven more, more uh, clients to follow suit and more brands to do the same thing. And finally, uh, let's just all remind ourselves of this cringe-worthy uh, moment back from February this year. Guys, guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, there's a, this, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. Moonlight won. Come on, I, this is not a joke. Come this on. is not a joke. I'm afraid they read the wrong thing. This is not a joke. Moonlight has won Best Picture. Moonlight, Best Picture.
guys. I mean, such a whopping ouch, but uh, it's just, uh, it still makes me cringe. But a brand that was clever enough and agile enough to kind of capitalize on the events as it happened uh, was Spec Savers. I put my teeth in. Uh, they got this campaign up within hours of the event itself. And I think if the creative had been ready, it could have been up within seconds. It just wasn't, and that's why it took hours. And I think, you know, the ability to react real time to news, environments, and events exists, but we need to encourage and we need to help more brands to sort of start using it. So there's just a kind of few examples that I've kind of cherry picked today from me. Um, but ultimately, sort of being new to this side of the fence and new to, the, to this part of the industry, it's not about how we reinvent the wheel, but instead about how can we take the oldest me medium that exists and deliver it in a new and modern way. It's about how can we all, as an industry, go the extra mile to deliver those things that practically and emotionally, they're just not happening enough yet. Whether that's full motion, whether it's data capture, whether it's handing over the keys to the, the controls of our screens to clients. And there's a whole world of possibilities out there. And I'm really excited because there's such an untapped, uh, untapped world of what we can do. And although the world is changing through technology, along with people's habits and behaviors, the fundamentals of advertising still and will always remain. And I think, as Bill Burnback sort of rightly said at the beginning, let's make sure we are concerned with the unchanging man. And for now, I will leave the last word to uh, Homer himself and say, you've come a long way, Mr. Billboard. Thank you.